Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Utenville Baptist Church Sunday School Edition. Um, here again, John Perez, your Sunday School teacher. Woo! Don't you guys just love me? I've been here for the last, I don't know, four to six weeks. I've not been fired yet, so I must be doing an, at least an okay job, or no one is really watching these videos. But I'm thinking that I'm doing an okay job, I guess. So we're going to continue on. We're going to do this Bible study. Today we're going to be in session seven of Proverbs. We're going to be looking at living wisely. So if you have your book, it's really important that you have your book today. If you don't have your book, we're gonna, I'm going to try and explain this to you. But it would be much easier if you had your book. If you don't have one, come on by the church. We'll get you one. And you guys can actually study along with us using the um, Lifeway books that we have. But session seven, that's page 64, living wisely. We're going to be in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 8 through 15. So if you just turn to Proverbs, you're going to look for um, verses 8 through 15. Pretty cool verses that we're going to be going over today. And it starts off, the, the study starts off with asking a question about cooking. It, it, it references a souffle and how you have to have like a souffle. You have to have the eggs just right in order for it to actually be a souffle. I know nothing about souffles. I do know something about smoking meat though. And it was talking about like how if you don't do that little part right, it's not going to come out right in the souffle and you'll have a messy kitchen and, and a nasty souffle. Well, all I can tell you is this, is that I really don't know much about that. But while I do know smoking meat, I understand the point of being able to follow directions and how important those things are. One of the things that I found uh, to be the most uh, disappointing thing when you're out smoking meat is the fact that when you're smoking meat, it's a slow cook process, right? And so when you're, when you're doing this, you want to be able to trust the fact that you have the right temperature because what you don't want to have is, is a temperature too low or a temperature too high, especially when you're cooking meat for an extended amount of time because you can get undercooked meat, you can get overcooked meat, and you can get it from like, you know, you want it to be able to fall off the bone and be very tender, and you're looking for that sweet spot. And if you don't, if you if you undercook it, it's not going to be tender. If you overcook it, it's also not going to be tender. So you're looking for that really, really good, you know, that moment in which the meat is just perfect. And and so smoking, while I think souffle is kind of cool and it's like one of those really fancy dishes that people try and make, I dare you to try and smoke some meat and do a good job because it's hard. And that's why following directions is so important. And I think when we look over the book of Proverbs, we can easily look at our lives and go, yes, following directions is important. When we change our oil, we need to make sure we pour oil back into the place where we need to pour oil into and not into a different area of the motor. Um, we need to look at, you know, when we're uh, following and driving and doing anything, we can look at those rules and understand that. And, and how rules and, you know, how we follow directions is great. But for the Bible, for the most part, is, is something that we look at and what Solomon was really trying to write here, or the author of this proverb specifically, um, was really trying to convey was the wisdom in which we should be looking at the Word of God and following its directions very closely. A lot of our lives would be a lot simpler if we all just follow directions to the T, right? And, and if we looked at it in this, in this sense that, you know, if we follow directions, life will be going well. It's pretty simple, but it's actually, practically, it's impossible for us to continue to do it right. So tonight, today we're going to be looking at some Proverbs. We're going to be living wisely. So let's go ahead and, uh, without further ado, dig into Proverbs 14, 8 through 15, and really look into it. So what we're going to do here is look at the context, then we'll dig in. So here at verse um, Proverbs chapter 14, verses um, 8 through um, uh, 8 through 15, Paul, or no, not Paul, uh, the author here is lit using a literally de literary device known as a, a chas chasmus, chiasmus. It's a term that refers to an arrangement of ideas that uh, is then repeated in reverse order. So the purpose behind this type of literary uh, feature was for the repetitive and comparative emphasis. All right, so if you're looking at your study here, it gives a little um, format to 8 through 15, and it says um, verse 8, 9, 10, and 11, 11, and, and then 12. And so if you're looking at it, it kind of builds like a mountain. So you have um, A, the prudent, uh, the prudent and the fools. B, making amends uh, for, for sin. C, secrets of the heart. And then it goes D, destruction for the wicked. D, uh, the way of death. And so if you're looking at this, you are looking at um, uh, the beginning of this mountain. So you're climbing up it. So verses 8, 9, and 10, 11, you're peaking. At 12, you're peaking. And then at 13, 14, 15, you're coming down. And then so if you look at um, verse 13, which is, again, C, that's secrets of the heart. And then B, uh, being uh, repaid for sin. And then A, a simple, uh, the simple and the prudent. And if you look at it, 
um, in the sense of uh, A and A. So if you look at the first two, you have prudent and fools. If you look at uh, verses 9 and 14, you'll see... Um, you know, this, this repayment for sin, this idea of sin that comes across here. If you look at 10 and 13, you'll see um, the heart involved in there. And then if you look at uh, 11 and 12, you'll, say, you'll see destruction for the wicked or the payment or the, the price of sin. And so that's a really cool thing. I didn't know that. I was looking at this and I was like, oh man, this is actually pretty cool. Um, but like I was telling you guys, if you're looking at Proverbs, this makes it simpler in the sense that if you have your book here, it's like, wow, this is made very, very clear here. And so we're going to start off here. We're going to look at um, verses 8 and 15. And so this is kind of cool. So we're not going to go directly in line. We're going to use this chiasmus idea that the writer did here. It is pretty interesting. So let's go ahead and read it, and we'll get started. So it says Proverbs 14, 8, 15. All right, so it says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of the fool is deceit. It says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well uh, to his going. Now, the word prudent here is, is, is the idea that, you know, uh, some of us actually look at the word and, and go, man, you know, what a prude, right? Like this idea, this word has been so misused over time that the word prudent has actually lost its real and true meaning. And when we look at it within the biblical text, it, especially right here, the context from which it was written, prudent is, is a very, very, very good word. It's, it is not something that, that we should be ashamed of, all right? Prudence involves like thinking things through, all right? It involves the opportunity for us to challenge and carefully look at issues and problems in our lives. The prudent man, the one who is looking at their life and actually asking themselves before they commit to something, looking at the situation from the outside before stepping in, this is the man who lives wisely. A lot of us like to go ahead and just, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, right? A lot of us like to try and do that. Like, I am very like that. I mean, as a kid, I've always had to sit there and ask myself, should I do this before I actually do this? Because a lot of the times when I do things without thinking is when I actually get into a lot of trouble. And I still today fall into that trap of I say things or I do things. And I know you do too. If you're listening to this, you can go, amen, brother, because I like to do things without thinking about them sometimes. And then I end up having to reap the consequences. Or you sit there and have a lot of anxiety about a decision that you made that you probably shouldn't have made. Ladies, I'm talking to you. You know that when you're shopping online, you go back at night and you're like, should I have really bought in all those shoes? The answer was no, that wasn't a very prudent decision, although it might be kind of nice. That's the idea of prudence is when we look at our decisions before we actually commit to doing them. And so when we're, when we're looking here, it says the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his ways. Okay, the understanding of ways, looking at yourself, looking at those choices, asking yourself, is this really what God wants for me? And I think a lot of my problems and probably a lot of your problems would be solved if we would just stop for two seconds and ask ourselves in a prudent fashion and ask and be honest with ourselves long enough to be to sit there and say, probably not worth it. And so we're looking at these decisions and we're drawing conclusions based on a careful analysis of what's going on in our lives. It says a person who practices prudences will be referred to as sensible. And I cannot explain it any better than that. I don't know if I should go any further than that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And so we go in here, it says the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well into his doings. And, and the idea here is just don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. Don't just look at something and take it for what it for what for what it for what it appears to be. Look at it. Ask yourself before you guys do it. There are so many traps out there for us as Christians that we 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 begin to really identify with one thing over another. And we look at it and we go, oh, we should just automatically believe this. We shouldn't look at it. We shouldn't ask any questions. We just jump in and believe it. Um, I see it all over social media. I see it all over the world now. It's that, you know, if someone that we kind of identify with in any way, shape, or form has an idea, comment, or thought process on something, we don't question it. We don't think about it. We don't research it. All we do is we jump on the bandwagon. This is this bandwagon mentality. And this is, and the proverb speaks again against this kind of thought process of just jumping onto a thought process that everyone else wants to jump onto doesn't make it right. We should always be asking ourselves. We should always be looking at God's word. We should always be prudent in before we before we speak, before we, we act, before we move, before we say anything or do anything. We should think about it. 
Think about it. The author of this verse, these verses here, would have us be prudent, be wise. Don't be simple in your thinking. Don't be so narrow-minded as to only look at it from one direction. A lot of my misconceptions in my life have been, have been uh, you know, uh, brought out through me asking questions and challenging myself to see things from a different point of view. We'll never be able to understand what's in this word if we don't question our motives, if we don't look at ourselves, if we don't look and dig into this word and ask ourselves, are we really trying to do this? So anyways, that's verses 8 through 15. Don't be gullible. Be prudent. And I think one of the things here is, is the, it, asks, it asks us here that uh, this, this idea can be summarized here about looking at someone who is sensible, who is uh, this prudent Christian. And one of the people that came to my mind when I was, when I was uh, reading through this study was a, was, a, my, was a friend named Max. And now Max was a man that uh, was, uh, lived at this orphanage that I worked at. He was a man that was just really God-honoring. And he would always uh, be super quiet. And I, I never understood why he was always so quiet. He was always so reserved. And we would have men's Bible studies there. And Brother Max would never say a word. Every time we would be there, we'd be challenging each other. We would be talking about God's word. And Max would just sit there. And I never understood why, but it wasn't until like a year, a year into the studies that he began to speak. And he took almost a year's worth of Bible studies. And when he opened his mouth and began to speak, the words were so meaningful, were so impactful, were, were so well thought out. It was for me, it was like, where, where was this guy all this time. But the thing was, is that Max was a very prudent man. He didn't speak and he didn't say things that he didn't think were extremely important and relevant and on topic and on point. He always measured and weighed his words before he said them. And for me, I was like, I like to talk. I love to talk. And some of the things that I say are, the, are just not right. They're just wrong. And that's funny to even admit the fact that, you know what, look, I'm up here talking to you guys and I can tell you right now, sometimes these words come out before the, my mind actually had, gets a hold of them to actually say them. Because even like I think last week I said I went to the metal to the pedal. Yes, I said that. I said metal to the pedal because my mind, my mouth went before my mind. And, you know, I say things like that all the time. And the, you know what, in youth group, they make fun of me all the time because I'll sit there and I'll have words that go completely backwards. Because this thing starts moving faster than this thing is moving. And that's a problem. But Max, he was so prudent in what he would say. Every time he opened up his mouth, I wanted to hear what he had to say. Man, I wish that, that people would look at and say that about me. Like, man, every time John speaks, I really want to know what, like, what he wants to Like, I really want to listen to what he says. Unfortunately, because I talk so much, people end up just zoning me out. It's probably not a great thing, especially for someone who's trying to counsel. So I need to work on that, right? So I think we could all work on that. I think we could all look at our lives and we can go, what areas do we need to be more prudent about? So for me personally, I look at my life and I go, I need to be more sensible. I need to be more prudent. And before I speak, before I say anything, I need to weigh and measure my words. Maybe you have this, uh, the, the, the inability to, to control maybe your spending, and you're having problems with finances, you need more prudence in that area of your life. I don't care what it is. There's an area in which you need and I need to improve and be more sensible and be more prudent. We could, it's easy for us to do, be simple and just go with the flow and just do as we want to do, but that is not what the author of Proverbs would have us do. He says, don't be simple-minded. It's not that easy. Life isn't that easy. Look at your choices, weigh them out, measure them. So as we're looking through this, we're going to go from, uh, the, from this prudent idea. And the key doctrine would be that, um, that, that Scripture here is supreme. There's a su supreme standard by which all human uh, conduct, creed, and religious opinions should be tried upon. So and that's Acts 17.11. So if you go to Acts 17.11, basically the whole the, the whole key doctrine of what we just talked about here, this prudent understanding is that we would measure all of our actions, that we would measure all of our thoughts through the word, through God's holy scriptures. And so now we move on to uh, the content 
um, section of this, which is Proverbs 4, uh, 14, 9 through 14, or 9 and 14. And it says this, Fools make a mock of, at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Now, Solomon contrasted here, he, he said, fools who mock at sin and the righteous on whom there is favor. Now, the Hebrew word rendered uh, sin can have different nuances and meanings, right? But the primary usage as it is designed for the, the, the guilt or trespass offering here, okay? So the righteous demonstrate a willingness to make a peace offering, okay, or to make reparation uh, with others when needed, all right? So the idea here is that when you sinned, especially in the in those days and ages, against someone, it wasn't a, it wasn't just the the coming to church and asking for forgiveness. Is that you made reparations for that sin? Is that you actually paid back that sin? And so, making reparation recalls Old Testament law, which was exceedingly clear. Okay, regarding the need to make reparations for sin. So, for example, a man who had cheated or stolen or lied or had uh, to make a restitution uh, to an individual who had been like victimized by his sinful attack. Um, he would he would go out and make that right, right? So further, he had to present a guilt or trespass offering to the priest as well. So it wasn't just this simple act of one thing. He, he It had to go across the board. And this is the idea here that we really want to kind of really wrap our minds around is that when, 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 when we're reading this, especially in this proverb here, um, this righteousness, this seeking out what is good, um, this idea is far deeper then we really understand it to be because today I think we take it so so lightly. We don't really um, look at the consequences as much as they did back then. Imagine, imagine having wronged somebody and having to make reparations to that person. So often we kind of go, oh, you know, um, I'm, I'm sorry. And then we walk on our way. We just kind of, you know, oh, we, you know, uh, half meant it, half didn't mean it sometimes. And then we go to God and we, 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 we repent. We go, God, you know, I was wrong and that was wrong. And, and I know it was wrong and, and God forgive me. And yeah, okay, we're good, right? We're good. Okay, good. And we walk away. And there was no reparation in that. There wasn't actually really even a true conviction in our hearts for the fact that we had done wrong. We, we came to God, we acknowledged it was wrong, we walked away, we really didn't have any change of heart. In, these, in those days, man, when you wronged somebody and you had to pay it all back, you had to look at the guy in the face, you had to sit there and make it right, that, that right there is sincere. There's a certain sincerity about that, and I think we've lost a little bit of that here. But that doesn't mean that we can't make it right. That doesn't mean that we can't push ourselves further. So the amount of restitution had to be established in the law, and God's people had to be instructed to, re to, in, to regard the matter of restitution by, by something holy, right? So to contrast Solomon was to, the contrast Solomon was making in verses 9 was actually the contrast between um, contentment and discontentment, actually. So the foolishness uh, will lead to discontentment, but the wise living uh, leads to contentment, all right? So this is what Paul's point was in, in Philippians 4, 10 through 14, where he, was, where he spoke about being content in Christ, all right? Paul insisted that contentment is something that can be learned and applied, and Paul applied this contentment knowledge of God in times where there was... Uh, uh, there was plenty, and in times where he lacked even the basic necessities of life, Paul understood this idea of contentment. He understood the idea that God is enough. And so in each and every circumstance, he had learned to be content in the person of Jesus. So contentment in him means that he can be content in our, that we can, that we can be content in our circumstances without being uh, content with these circumstances. So Paul used God to be an agent of change within undesirable circumstances. So we're going back here, looking at this. It says, Fool may, uh, fool, uh, fools make a mock uh, at sin, uh, but among the righteous there is favor. It says, Backsliders in, in, in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied for himself. Now, the backslider in heart suggests someone that's being... Um, uh, uh, someone who like maybe might have been a follower at some point in time of the Lord and then turns back, all right? Uh, and that person who takes that step back from the path, that path, God's wisdom, um, and then returns to like his own desires. He, he, he's gone away from what he knows to be true. This person is going to be filled 
with the fruit of his own ways. And that's pretty obvious. And then on the other hand, we have the, a good man, the person who walks in God's wisdom, shall be satisfied from himself. And this idea here is that we would um, the, take the understanding of this, the sowing and the reaping of what we do in our walk, in our daily walk. And so when we're looking at these verses and we're trying to really get a clear and concise understanding of this, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy that when we're, looking at, when we're looking at the fools making a mockery at sin, I think, the, I think of really the idea here of, of this, uh, this man who really, really, you know, doesn't get what God's word truly has to offer him. The way in which we need to look at instances in our lives, the way in which we need to look at sin and look at the hurt and the pain that this brings, not only to our lives, but other people's lives. And you can see this in society across the world that we begin to have this indifferent attitude, this idea that we just don't care anymore, that it's not important, that when we look at, when we look at sin and we look at how people are, we just, you know, we only are considering ourselves. We look at the pain of other people and we go, it's just not my problem, not my issue, therefore I'm not going to take any you know, I'm not going to even pay attention to it. And that's wrong. All right. And this is, but among the righteous, there, there is favor. And, and that those that, that seek good shall, shall be satisfied away from himself. And this idea of contentment kind of comes into play. And so when we look at the, what God has to offer, we look at the, the, the life that God wants us to lead. And we look at the fact that, you know what, that, that the way God challenges us to live is the best way from which we could possibly approach life. Now, how do we really understand this verse? How do we really kind of apply this and make it applicable to us? Well, I have a really great little story there and a little personal testimony, and it has to involve orphans. I think one of the greatest and most beautiful things that I've ever witnessed in my entire life is this understanding, the idea of, of this child being abandoned by the ones who should have loved them the most, their parents. And it's always amazing to see an orphan because this is the most vulnerable person on the planet at this point, a child with no one to love them. And when they came to the orphanage, especially when, you know during the time that I was there and I was able to witness to so many young children who had just been completely abandoned or taken away from bad parents, um, this idea of contentment, this idea of, of, you know, they don't have anything, yet here they are really trying to find and pursue God and content, content to have even just a bed at night, content in just having a clean pair of underwear, a content with having to share clothes with other kids. Not having nothing that's actually theirs. See, this in my heart, I just look at this and I go, I look at this verse and I go, where am I in this verse? How am I living this out practically? Am I really looking at my life? Am I really living out my faith in such a way that I am walking away from myself every single day? That I am denying this sinful man within me and walking towards Christ? Or am I feeding this, I, this, this person inside of me? Am I feeding myself versus, versus my spirit? Am I feeding uh, my desires versus God's desires for me? Am I living this idea of, 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 of contentment? Because we don't have this, idea, we don't have this restitution. We don't have the, uh, the, the, the sin offering. We don't have to go back and, 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 and make this repayment for sin to someone that we've wronged. We don't have to do this anymore. The, the Jew understood this in a way that we'll never understand this. The Jew understood this, this, this proverb much deeper than we could ever understand this because when they sinned, they had to pay it back. Not only the person that they wronged, but they also had to go to the priest. They had to, they had to air it out in front of everybody. And so everybody saw it. It was out there. And then we would look at a person who was outright sinning and say, they're a fool. They're going to have to pay that all back. If they want to get right with God, that, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the most irresponsible person on the planet. Why would they ever do something like that? Because not only is it uh, out there for, and for everybody to see when they actually do try and make it right, you know, at this point, they understood it in a way that we never understood it. So we look at this in, in, in the dispensation of grace from which we're living right now, this idea that, you know, now we are saved by grace. 
makes this even more complicated for us in the sense that, you know what? Now we have to look at this idea and we have to go, man, this is applicable in, in a different way for us in the sense that when we look at ourselves, we have to understand that, you know, that the, the fool makes a mock at sin and but among the righteous there is favor the backslider in heart shall be filled in his own ways and uh, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself the idea that we have to look at this and go you know inside of me i am fighting this battle and right now we as christians we need to understand that if we are not living a life in which we are living in contentment with God, in which we are trying to seek God in, our, in every single way, this whole, this sin life can so easily entangle us, can so easily ensnare us. It could be, it could be this idea, you know, this, this little secret thing that just ends up growing within our hearts and just really takes us and leads us away from God. It really will. And so contentment is the idea here. The idea that we would do it, we would, look for God in every single way and that we would look at Paul especially in Philippians when he when he says you know I'm out I'm down I have nothing but I still see Jesus I still see him and I want to serve him no matter what's happened to me I want to serve God that's the kind of person that we should all be looking to see we should I, I take this the lesson of the orphan and I go man if they can be content in those circumstances if they can love and cherish and 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 sing up to God and praise God in that moment of them being the most vulnerable time of their lives Lives, having to rely on strangers for help and be okay with that. I need to grow up. I need to look at my sin. I need to be able to look inside myself and be honest with myself and go, I need to grow up. So Proverbs um, 14, 10 through 13 is joyful. Now this is the next part of this. It says here, it says, the heart knoweth his own uh, bitterness and a stranger doth not in, in, intermeddle with his joy. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Now, the idea here that we're going to try and get across is because appearances can be deceiving and no one really knows what another person is feeling in his or her heart, Solomon declared that the person who appears to be happy might not act, might, may actually be bitter. All right? So we also know that laughter is not to be confused with joy. All right? The Hebrew word translated sorrowful can also mean pain. So a person's laughter can be to try and mask his own pain. And uh, that's why Solomon noted that even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful and the, the end of that mirth is heaviness. So as believers, we don't need to wear masks to conceal our pain and grief. And so this, this idea here is the heart and at the root of, of, of the believer. We have to really understand that we need to seek God in these moments in which we are, we are suffering, in which there is pain in our lives. And so pursuing godly wisdom results in joy. Now, the idea here is that Obviously, joy is not related exactly to happiness, right? Happiness is an emotion that is coming and going, and it, and it, and it, and it can be there in one moment and not in the next. But joy is the pursuing, uh, persistent attitude of uh, being able to, whether being in negative circumstances or positive circumstances, we are glorifying God. So uh, such joy holds up under the trials of life, all right? Consequently, as believers, we don't need to wear masks to conceal our pain and grief. Instead, we can count on that joy that comes in our walk with God and to sustain us even when our heart aches, all right? So a, a grief, it awaits us all, right? It's, it's always there, but our joy in Christ will hold us up in those times of grief, and that's the point that we all really need to understand here. The desire to be happy is common to all people, but how a person defines happiness makes all the difference in the world. Real, lasting joy comes from knowing and doing the will of God. It comes from being in the center of God's purpose for one's life, even when that purpose, all right, may take a person through the valleys of the shadow of death, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't feel good. So that is joy. So when you're looking at this, 
proverb we've gone through so far, and, and we've gone through the prudent man, what that means, and how we're we looking at prudence, and how we need to be asking ourselves the hard questions, right? And then we look at contentment, and how, you know, while things are different back then we, than, than it is today, we need to really look at our lives, and we really need to ask ourselves, are we being content with what we have? Are we being content in how God is, you know, how, we're, how, how we are living our lives to, you know, towards God? Are we, uh, you know, are we, are we denying ourselves? Are we walking towards the light? Are we practicing the things that we preach? Are we, are we really pursuing God in our lives? The contentment in all circumstances, in all situations, the sinful man won't ever be content. The sinful man won't ever be okay with what he has. And then in that moment, when, we, when we're looking at this joyful, this idea of joy, that we can take the idea that, that the prudent man will look at the situation and ask the hard questions. The content man will accept the fact that not everything's going to work out in their, in their, in, in their, their way. And that the, the joyful person is going to believe and, and exalt God even though it might not be the best thing on the planet for them at that moment, even though it might not be the, 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 the thing they wished for the most, even though it might be hard and difficult. They'll look at it and they'll still praise God. Do you see where this is going? Do you, are you following me here? So the last thing here is thriving. So it, when we look at it and we're, we're following the prudent, the, the content, and the joyful Christian life, when we, when we are putting those three together, we begin to thrive. We begin to really move forward. So it says here, and this is a really weird way to kind of, not necessarily a weird way to look at it, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, you can compare the negative and look at the positive here. So here, let's, let's read 11 and 12. It says here, the house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright uh, shall flourish. See, compare and contrast, easy. So there is a way in which seemeth right unto a man, but in, but the end there, there, thereof are the ways of death. Now, so we're, we we we're looking at all this. This is the this is the this is the the point in which the the, the proverb comes to the uh, the most important part. So usually at the end would be the most important part, and we would get the introduction. And we'd have the conclusion in most verses. Here we are in the middle of the proverb, and this is the the point. This is the the most important point in which the the the, the, the guy the person who wrote this proverb wants to make here, and Solomon really. So. Solomon was using this literary device um, again, and uh, the writer employed this literary device they wrote uh, as the main idea. So this is where we're at. So the idea here is God's people thrive, even though it appears they have little according to worldly standards. And this idea here is so true, and it's so real that, you know, when the world, we look at out at the world and we look at what the world has, the world would look at us and go, you have nothing. And then I look at the world and I say, well, I have everything, but they, they don't understand that. They could never understand that. They could never understand why I'm content. They could never understand why I don't do what, why I do what I do. And so here's the house of the wicked shall be overthrown. And, and when I look at this and I read this and I go, yes, yes, yes. Because for me, I, I, I understand that when we, when we have all of our possessions, when we have everything that, that is important to us bound here on this world, it's all vanity. It's all pride. It's all arrogance. It's all for naught. It's worthless. And eventually it's all getting taken away. I mean, I look at the stock market and I don't understand it. I mean, I get what it does. I know how it works. But then when I look at when people do it, and they do it all the time, and then they're so surprised when it all gets taken away. They're like, oh, it's all gone. Well, yeah, because it's worldly. It's worldly. It, it, it'll come and it'll go. It'll, it's not here forever. You know, when we look at the world today, we, we look around us and we go, oh, the world's terrible. The world's falling apart. We're all going to, you know, we're all going to perish. You know, come on, Jesus, let's go. I don't understand. Have you not looked around you before? Have you not seen history? Have you not seen that, that everything comes up and it falls down? Everything. Nothing lasts forever. We're not living in a perfect world here. I'm sorry. Yes, we're going to be persecuted. Yes, as Christians, not, nothing, it's no, not ever going to work out in our favor all the time. And, I, and, I, and I'm surprised when Christians, they walk around with their head down like, we've, we've lost. It's all gone. We don't have it anymore. 
you know what? Just throw in the towel. If anything, right now, right now, we should be looking at our lives. We should be looking at our faith. We should be asking ourselves these questions. Do we really believe what's written in this proverb? Are we looking at the situation prudently? Are we looking at it from a standpoint of contentment? Are we looking at it joyfully? And are we willing to want to believe that we can thrive even though things look at their darkest? Because I think deep down, none of us really believe that. We're looking at the, the United States today and we go, we've lost it. We're gone. We're, you know, we're never going to be back. It's, it's all, you know. But this proverb here would challenge us to look at it differently. Solomon would said, he said it here. He's trying to tell us. He's like, look, son, not everything's going to be roses. Not everything's going to work out in your favor. Not everything's going to be okay. The world may fall down around you, but you still have God. You have Jesus, and that's the most important thing that you can have. As long as you have that, everything else can go away. Do you believe that? So it says here, the, wicked, the house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Do you believe that? Do you believe that tabernacle will flourish? I think so, because I think the Christian who's being persecuted for their beliefs is going to be stronger, is going to be more faithful, is going to be more content, is going to be more prudent, is going to be more joyful, and is going to thrive. The lazy, arrogant, backstepping, backsliding Christian, you know, that one that never gets challenged, that one who never has to stand for what they believe in, that one who just comes in and just does their thing and, and then moves on, you know, living from one day to the next, not really reading their Bible, not really challenging themselves, not really praying, not really doing what they need to do, that one won't thrive. So there is a way in which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The challenge here is that you would look at it and you would say, right, am I walking this way that is leading me to Christ or am I walking the way which is leading me to death? And that if you're walking the direction that is leading to death, you would be honest with yourself for a moment long enough to sit there and go, you know what, I need to change. And then be brave enough to actually do it. God wants to offer us peace, joy, tranquility. Maybe we won't find it here. But this is the point of having a kingdom mindset. This is the point of where we look up, not down, and not behind, not to the side. You keep your eyes on heaven. That's how this works. That's how this is being able to make complete. And all that right here, and all that is found right here. Within God's holy word, within the scriptures. The challenge here at the end of our thing is to look at somebody else that is walking the wrong way. And to ask, them, ask ourselves, what way is that path going to end up for them? And to pray for that person. I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you, what is a wrong way that you are following? And to look at that path and ask yourself, where is it leading you? And that to pray for yourself to change. We don't need to be looking at other people. We have enough problems of our own. We don't need to sit there and look at a person and judge them in the way that they're walking. We need to be honest with ourselves and look at the way we're walking and change that. I can't help that person if I can't even help myself. So you need to ask yourself that question. You need to challenge yourself in that moment. What way are you walking and if you're walking that direction, what path is it going to take you down? And how can you change and make your way out of that path? And being able to live this to thrive. Because the idea here is that a Christian wouldn't be withering, that we would be thriving, even in the worst circumstances. So I'm going to go ask you to pray with me right now. And if you've thought that thing out, and if you got that thing in your head, great. If you don't, you need to look at it and you need to ask yourself, what, what way am I, am I not thriving? What way is my, my faith kind of walking away? Uh, what way am I walking away from my faith? If you need to think about that for a bit, okay. 
But let me pray for you in the meantime. So if you would bow your head and close your eyes and pray with me, we'll finish up our, our study today. So Father God, we ask you to um, just be with us today as we walk through Proverbs, as we looked at the life of the, the Christian that is, um, that is prudent, content, joyful, and thriving, Father God, that we would be able to see where folly lies in our lives, that we would be able to realize that, ask ourselves these questions, and really challenge ourselves, that we would be able to... Um, be able to walk stronger, be able to walk in, in a way in which, Father God, that you would be glorified, that we would uh, be walking in the light and that other people could see that. So uh, while, you know, I know where my struggles lie, Father God, and I know that I need to change, Father God, I ask that you would work in the heart of every single person who's listening today, that you would be working in their heart, that you would be challenging them, and that you would be, that you would be strengthening them and emboldening them to walk away from sin, to walk away from foolishness, and to walk in the light. So we pray for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.